Welcome, and thank you for joining the Mark Montclair's online worship experience. We hope you will be blessed by what you experience today. Feel free to worship and sing along as if we are together in the sanctuary, as we are indeed together in spirit with God and one another. Hi, welcome to the Mark Montclair. Welcome to the Mark. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the mic. mic. We're glad you're here. Good morning, St. Mark's family. This is the day that the Lord has made, and let us rejoice and be glad in it. If you're glad to be here this morning, I just dare you just wave your hands and give God a praise. This is the day that the Lord has made.
team of worship God because he is so worthy of all the praise. Can I get an amen? Amen and amen. So people of God, even as we continue to transition in our worship service, let's turn our attention or keep our attention to our screen as we get into some announcements. Let's see what is going on in the life of the mark this week. Here's what's going on at the mark. Mark your calendars and join us for United Methodist Women's Day on Sunday, September 26th at 10 a.m. This year's theme is Finding Peace in an Anxious World. Are you interested in mission work, church relations, discipleship, or small group development? This fall, the United Methodists of Greater New Jersey offer courses designed to help you develop and grow in ministerial leadership. Each course is open to clergy and laity and is comprised of 90-minute online sessions offered over several weeks. Sign up today for a course in your area of interest. St. Mark's Church Conference is scheduled for Tuesday, October 12th at 8 p.m. via Zoom. All members are encouraged to attend. Please call or email the church office for more information. Join us for a block party style outdoor homecoming celebration on Sunday, October 10th at 10 a.m. on Fulton Street. Not only are we getting together, we're giving together. We invite you to bring donated diapers and sanitary napkins to support refugee families in our area. As a reminder, please keep the safety of every guest and member in mind and wear your mask during service so that we can keep each other safe. We can't wait to see you. Even though we are physically separated, we want to stay in community with you. Fill out a connection card online for prayer, contact from a church leader, or any other needs you may have. We are here for you. In this time of uncertainty, please remember the sick and shut in in your prayers and with a call or card. That's what's going on at the mark. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. I am so excited to be worshiping with you today as we begin another week. And right there at home, I encourage you to give God praise for our choir, our praise team, our musicians, all of the folks who are leading in worship. I encourage you uh, to govern yourselves accordingly as you have heard our announcements this morning. And I want to encourage you to give. We need your resources and your support here at The Mark so that we can continue serving in mission and in ministry. We have some exciting things happening as we start off the fall. We have some plans underway for our young people and people of all ages. But we cannot do this without your resources. So I encourage you to go to our website, www.themarkmtc.org, or you may give me a cash app at dollar sign, the Mark MTC. And I have continued to give. I have increased my giving in this time and pray that you would do the same as God enables you. I encourage you to continue praying for our sick and shut-in members in our congregation, those who have lost loved ones. Please reach out to them and let them know that they are not alone. And now we continue in worship with this wonderful music from our choir. And I'll be back with you in just a few moments as we hear the word of the Lord. Amen.
living room, at your dining table, in your car, still in the bed. We are just so grateful that you have chosen to worship with us here in the park this morning. And again, we give God praise for our music ministry, our AV team, all of those who are leading in worship this morning. Our sermon this morning comes from the book of James, chapter 2. James, chapter 2, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 4 from the New Revised Standard Version, and it reads, My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and fine clothes comes into your assembly, and a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And our sermon this morning is entitled, Actions Speak Louder Than Words. Actions Speak Louder Than Words. Pray with me. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. We thank you, God, that you have allowed us to come into this space to worship you once more and again. God, we know that you didn't have to wake us up this morning, but you did, and so we sing your name. And in today's 
today's passage from chapter 2, James warns against favoritism and elitism. He says, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? This question James poses acts as a rhetorical device meant to provoke his audience to examine their behavior. It's like when you were growing up and your parents asked you a question that they already knew the answer to. Who ate all the Captain Crunch or who left this swig of orange juice in the refrigerator? They already knew the answer, but they were asking you to cause you to reflect on your actions. And so here James is asking them to consider, are you really uh, reflecting your love and your relationship with Jesus Christ by showing favoritism to people in your midst? And are you doing more than just saying the right things, just talking about your faith, but do you really believe in the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth? For James, belief is not just about professing a set of rules, but belief is demonstrated in our behavior. And James goes on in that same verse, for if a person comes in wearing gold rings or fancy clothes in today's uh, society, gold chains or fancy shoes, if they pull up in a Tesla or a Benz, would you treat them better than you would the person who has no chains, who has holes in their shirt, or who's driving a hoopty? Have you not made distinctions between these people when you tell some to sit right here in the front and others you can sit over there at my feet? As we interpret James's words, we should be reminded that one's status in ancient Roman society was signified by their attire and jewelry, not all that different as we signify status today. A person's wardrobe determined the treatment they received from others. And one of the differences, though, that exists today that may not have existed as much then is that we also treat people differently based on their skin color. Uh, we still assess one's value by the melanin in their skin or the texture of their hair, by the width of their nose or, or the size of their hips. And every time we have to fill out a job application or a mortgage application and check African American and black or other, we are still reminded in 2021 that skin color still matters. Our skin color still determines who sits at the front of the bus versus the back of the bus or who has bus routes in their neighborhood at all. Our skin color still determines what kind of jobs we are able to get or what kind of neighborhoods we are welcome to move into. And unfortunately, people are still using skin color to determine who they should treat with dignity and who they think they should be allowed to treat with contempt. Is James saying to us this morning that we aren't supposed to notice difference, that we aren't supposed to notice skin color, that we aren't supposed to notice when somebody is rich or when somebody is poor? No, family, that's not what James is saying to us. Of course we notice difference. Babies can notice difference when they're just a few months old. There is nothing wrong with us having differences. If difference was a problem, God would not have made us different. In fact, I get offended when people say to me that they don't see color. Really? As chocolate as I am, you don't see this? You don't see this kinky hair that I had to pull real tight into these two braids? You think that I look exactly like Halle Berry? <laughs> Sometimes folks say things like this as a way to demonstrate that they are morally superior. Uh, but here's the thing, God made us different, and I'm proud of the way that God made me, and you should be proud of the way that God made you. Some of us are vanilla cream or caramel mocha or dark chocolate. Some of us have kinky hair or swirly hair or long, flowy hair. Some of us are straight up and down, and some of us have many, many curves, and there is beauty in all of the differences that God gave to us because if God wanted us to be the same, God would have made us the same. James is not saying that we are not supposed to notice the differences among us, but we do not assign value to people based on those differences. In chapter 1, James wrote that true religion is to care for the orphans and widows, and we cannot care for people if we do not notice them. We can and we 
you should take notice. But James is saying you don't treat people less than because of their differences. That's the sin. I'm reminded of the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who said that we should not judge people by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. We do not give places of higher esteem to the wealthy or those in fine robes or those with pale skin and degrade those who are poor or those who are in rags or those who have a darker skin. The world places a certain value on things, on, on these differences, and gives people certain privileges. But God, but the Bible says, listen, God has, has not God chosen the poor to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? This is reminiscent of Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Now I hear somebody saying, didn't James just say that we aren't Supposed to make distinctions, preacher, it sounds like you are uh, contradicting yourself. Uh, but that's not the point. Here it is, throughout scripture, we are taught that a true reflection of our religion and our worship is how we treat the poor and the most vulnerable among us. Liberation theologian Gustavo Gutierrez calls this God's preferential option for the poor. It's almost as if God believes in affirmative action. And it's not because God wants to disadvantage the wealthy or the privileged. It's because God realizes that poverty is not a result of faith. It is not the result of laziness. It is not the result of a few bad choices, but it is the result of structural injustices that create gains for a few at the expense of the masses. And so this passage, it warns us not to discriminate based on looks and not to play favors based on any human set of criteria. We are called to love. We are called to welcome each other. We are called to dignify the humanity of all of God's children. It does not matter whether they are rich or poor or black or white, whether they are gay or straight, trans, or whether they are able-bodied or disabled, whether they are smart or less than smart. In God's house and in God's family, it does not matter who is a part of this congregation. We are all made to feel God's love. This is God's world, not my world, not your world. And because this is God's world, everybody that God made should be allowed to thrive and enjoy God's creation. Especially in the church, uh, we have to remember that there are no superior people. I know that we like to think that all of that happens out in the world, but the truth is we give some folks VIP status right here inside the church. But Paul says there are uh, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you all are one in Christ Jesus. Uh, throughout American history, people have continued to relegate others to second-class status. A uh, black Methodist reminded white me the Methodists that we were not second-class citizens in the 1800s, and because blacks were forced to sit in the black-only section of St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia, Reverend Richard Allen founded the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, but the Methodist Church didn't get the point right away, and they continued to discriminate, and the Methodist Episcopal Church split in 1844 because some Methodists down in the South wanted to own slaves, and so they separated from the mother church and formed the Methodist Episcopal Church South. It took them 95 years to get over their superiority complex and reunite with the denomination. And still, today, there are people who want to relegate others to second-class status. Our denomination is on the brink of a split today because there are many people who insist on excluding the LGBTQIA community. But James reminds us that God did not make anybody less than. It does not matter their sexuality. It does not matter their skin color. It does not matter what region they're from. It does not matter how much education or don't have. It does not matter what zip code they were born into or what pedigree their family had. God made us all equal. James encourages us to spend less time focusing on trivial categories and judging others and instead spend more time caring for 
people's needs. In verse 14, James goes on to say, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but do not have works? In other words, we demonstrate our faith and our belief in Christ Jesus through not just what we say, but how we treat our neighbors. It's not enough just to take notice of them, but it's also required that we live and prioritize the needs of those in our midst. James says, show me your faith apart from your works, and I by my works will show you my faith. James here is not saying that we earn salvation by our works. We cannot do anything to earn salvation. James is not disagreeing with Paul's assertion that we are justified by faith. Rather, James is teaching that if we have genuine faith, it will be reflected in our behavior. Our faith, devoid of action, is meaningless. It's simply empty words. And many of us have worked alongside and lived alongside some folks who profess their faith, folks who walk around with the uh, badge of Christian, folks who will hang a cross in their yard, folks who will have crosses on their t-shirt and on their bumper sticker, but they're hateful and they're mean and they'll vote for politicians who talk down about other people. But if you dare question their faith, they get all offended. And I just want to say, uh, you may call yourself a Christian, but are you really following the teachings and the example of Jesus Christ? Jesus was a brown Palestinian Jew, and the truth is, if Jesus were walking around in our midst right now, some of the same folks who wear the badge of Christianity would not welcome him, would not follow him, would not receive or believe him, but they have equated their American nationalism with Christianity. That's another sermon for another day. I'm going to move on. But just because somebody said they're a Christian does not mean they are living the way that God has called them to live. Faith is not just our belief. In the Bible, we see that even the demons believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus says that the way that we show our faith is in what we do. In fact, he says that he would come back and separate the sheep from the goats, not because of what they believe, but based on how they acted. Uh, he doesn't say, I was hungry and you prayed that I would be fed. I was naked and you prayed that I would get clothed. No, Jesus says, I was hungry and you fed me. And I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you visited me. It is not enough to just talk about how we feel about our neighbors, but we demonstrate it in what we do and what we give. In my introduction, I mentioned how a, a black woman had made her third trip to the ER and she pleaded with the staff, if you don't admit me to the hospital, I'm going to die. But I left out the part where Vanessa Grubbs notes that the woman said, if you don't admit me to the hospital, I'm going to die. I can't breathe. I can't breathe is a sentiment that we've heard before. When New York City police took Eric Garner into custody for selling loose cigarettes in 2014, we heard him say, I can't breathe, before he died in the officer's chokehold. On May 25th, uh, Minneapolis uh, accused George Floyd of passing a counterfeit $20 bill, and we heard him say, I can't breathe, as he begged the officer kneeling on his back to release him. And the officer rested there with his hands in his pocket as if he were strolling through the park and he did not budge until George Floyd was dead. Uh, but sisters and brothers know this, George Floyd's death was not in vain. George Floyd's last words were not in vain because it caused the art of the moral universe to bend a little more towards justice. And instead of merely saying black lives matter, many of our white brothers and sisters put their faith into action when they protested in the streets and protested on social media. Polls estimate that between 15 to 26 million people demonstrated 
against police brutality and systemic racism. And the majority of those people were white people. Surprisingly to me, and perhaps some of you, televangelist Joel Osteen, who is strategically apolitical, participated in a march and stated in an interview, we grieve with them and we care about them. We love them and we stand with our black Brothers and sisters, he said, we are all made in the image of God. We're just here to support them. See, the collective response had a systemic effect. For the first time, a white Minnesota police officer was convicted of killing a black person. And family, I just want you to know this morning that when your actions speak louder than words, justice can be served. And when actions speak louder than words, the lowly are lifted up. When actions speak louder than words, the oppressed are set free. When actions speak louder than words, broken hearts are mended. When actions speak louder than words, God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. When actions speak louder than words, a white cop can finally be convicted for killing a black man or a black woman. When actions speak louder than words, your child won't just talk about diversity, but will get some diversity around the table. When actions speak louder than words, they start giving equitable mortgages and interest rates. When actions speak louder Those who are hurting. I pray for those whose bodies are wrapped with pain. 
healing, God. I pray that your healing power is flowing them right now. God, we pray for medical professionals who are back in emergency rooms and hospitals that are filled to capacity. We pray that you would just strengthen them to do their work. And God, that your healing power would flow all over this country and all over the world. And God, for all of the things that we need, we may not be able to put them into words. We might not know every person's name or prayer request, but we know you know. So we lift them all up to you now. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
there's nobody greater. There's nobody greater. Nobody greater than you. There's nobody greater. There's nobody greater. Nobody greater than you. Thank you. 